Isn't this photo amazing? <laughs> this photo was taken by the first spacecraft ever to visit Pluto. It's the surface of a world that had never been seen before, except as a fuzzy, vague blob, and that was even by the Hubble Space Telescope. That's because despite being part of the solar system, and even being considered a planet for 75 years, Pluto is very far away and very small. So far away that it takes light itself four and a half hours to traverse the distance between Pluto and here. So small, you could fit 150 Plutos inside Earth if it were hollow. So why would you want to explore such a small, distant object? Well, you can think of the solar system as having three zones. The inner zone has the four rocky terrestrial planets, including Earth. Outside of that, you have the four gas giants. Then the third zone includes the ice dwarfs of the Kuiper Belt, which is this vast ring of small icy objects out beyond the orbit of Neptune. Pluto is the largest of these objects, but the important thing about them that makes them special is that they are planetary embryos. They are literally the bodies out of which the larger outer planets accumulated. So if you want to understand how planets form, you need to understand these objects. This is the part where I admit to not being a scientist. <laughs> I'm not an astrophysicist, I'm not a planetary geologist. I can't tell you how to interpret this picture up here. What I am is an engineer who plays a small part in the New Horizons mission before launch when I was um, a software developer for the onboard software on New Horizons and now after launch when I'm one of a small number of people called flight controllers who operate the spacecraft from day to day remotely. So what I can tell you is how we got a piano-sized robot out to a target beyond what any spacecraft had ever visited before. So I mentioned that Pluto is very far away. If you want to get something to Pluto without having to wait decades, and that's not just a matter of being patient, it's a matter that creates some real practical obstacles, you need to go very fast. We used an Atlas V rocket and we added a third stage just to add even more speed. New Horizons left Earth at 37,000 miles an hour. That's faster than any spacecraft had ever been launched before. And at that speed, that also made it the first object ever to be launched from Earth directly on a path taking it out of the solar system. You probably know that there are already spacecraft out there leaving the solar system, like the Voyagers and the Pioneers. They are leaving the solar system, but that is because they had speed-ups from rockets fired after launch and from their planetary flybys. While New Horizons did perform a gravity assist a year after launch in 2007 by Jupiter, which did speed us up considerably, we are already destined for the stars. Another consequence of the great distance between Earth and Pluto is how little sunlight there is out there. Solar panels that far away from the sun just won't provide enough power. And fuel cells and batteries won't work either because of the long mission duration. What you need to use is a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, or RTG, that's what this is. It's a generator that makes electricity using the heat from a decaying radioactive material, in this case, plutonium. And by the way, the element plutonium itself and the Disney character Pluto, they were both named after what was then a recently discovered planet, which the planet itself was named for the Greek god of the underworld. So that's, that's who came first as far as Pluto goes. But RTGs are not a new technology. They've been used in spacecraft since the early 1960s on missions from the Apollo program to the Voyager probes to the Mars Curiosity rover. They all use RTGs. In fact, New Horizons is using a spare RTG from the Cassini mission. Ours is giving us about 200 watts of power right now. That's, in familiar terms, that's about enough power 
for running a window fan or a PlayStation console. And speaking of PlayStation, New Horizons happens to use the very same computer microprocessor that the PlayStation 1 used. <laughs> it's just modified to make it more resistant to the effects of radiation in space. We communicate with spacecraft using radio signals, much the same way that you would have to speak louder to be heard a farther distance away. We need strong radio signals to be heard or picked up from the receiver far away, like as far as Pluto and beyond, and to hear the signal sent back from the spacecraft after it's been so weakened by that distance. In order to get the fastest data rates we can to downlink those images and the data, we use the largest antennas we possibly can. And those are the 70-meter dishes of NASA's Deep Space Network. Here I am standing underneath one for scale. It gives you a sense of how massive these antennas are. That's 70 meters in diameter. So using these large antennas, we can get a downlink rate of about two or 3,000 bits per second right now. To put that in perspective, comparing it to the internet speeds you're used to when you upload a selfie or you download a movie or something, that's pathetically slow, right? I mean, it's orders of magnitude slower than you get on your phone using 3G or 4G service. It's that slow. So to download one high-resolution image from the spacecraft, it can take days. So if you had been wondering why the news isn't flooded with pictures from Pluto now that New Horizons has flown by, that's why. It just takes a while, so we have to be patient. For much of the journey to Pluto, we kept our spacecraft in what we call hibernation. That means we turned off most of the computers and instruments on board, leaving just a skeleton crew running and occasionally transmitting back a thumbs up or thumbs down beacon signal. It's thumbs up if everything's going okay in the spacecraft, no problem. It's thumbs down if it needs a little bit of help from mission control. And then about once a month, it would send a little bit of data back about how it's doing, things like temperatures and voltages. And then about twice a year, we would wake it up for several weeks at a time. And during that period of active operations, we would calibrate the instruments, we'd do a whole system checkout, we would correct the course by firing some thrusters if our trajectory was a little bit off, stuff like that. But for two thirds of the journey, we had it in hibernation mode. And uh, just as a symbol of the hibernation mode, we have this plush hibernation bear in our control center. We put him to sleep under the blanket when uh, the spacecraft's sleeping. We wake him up and put a little party hat on him <laughs> when, <laughs> when the spacecraft is awoken. So now he has the party hat on. But what's the point of the sleeping, anyway? Um, so for one thing, it extends the life cycle of parts on the spacecraft. For another, um, it frees up the deep space network for other missions, because there's lots of other spacecraft out there that have to use the deep space network just like we do. But maybe most importantly, it saves money by saving staff time. It frees up staff who would otherwise be working on operating the spacecraft to plan for the Pluto flyby. This planning took years. For one thing, we had to cram a ton of science observations into a really short period, about a day or so, when New Horizons would be really close to Pluto. But for another thing, we had to think about the possibility that there might be some debris in the way of, of New Horizons that we'd have to maneuver around in order to safely get to Pluto and beyond. And that would completely change the course, so we had to plan for all of these eventualities. 2015. For most of the day, our control center looked nothing like you are imagining on the day of closest approach to Pluto. It was nearly empty and very quiet. In fact, when the television cameras switched over to a view of our control room, this is what they saw. There's one person in the room, and that's the housekeeper vacuuming. <laughs> and the flight controller seats are taken up by our stuffed animals, including the hibernation bear and Pluto the dog. This is because our spacecraft was too busy doing science to talk to us. The last time we'd heard from it was the previous evening on the 13th, when it sent back one last picture before it turned to Pluto to target it 
for the intense science operations for the flyby. This is that picture that we got. We knew that even if something went wrong with the Pluto flyby, if we were so lucky as to be hit by some space rock and the worst happened, we at least had this one picture. But we didn't know if it would be the last. So fast forward to that evening of July 14th. I got to work and sat down in our mission control center, ready to, we all hoped, receive some kind of signal that our spacecraft was OK after performing hundreds and hundreds of maneuvers to get every possible look with every instrument at this dwarf planet. We were actually pretty calm, uh, considering. <laughs> We had extra deep space network antennas pointed at the planet. We kind of felt like all the eyes on Earth were, were pointed at our spacecraft, really. But we waited, and we're used to waiting, because we waited nine and a half years from launch to get our chance to fly by Pluto, and many of us had worked on the mission for years before launch. But after waiting a little bit, we got the signal. We did it. It was so thrilling. Um, we not only got the signal saying the spacecraft had survived the flyby, we could tell by how much data it had recorded on the solid state recorders on board that it had done all of those hundreds of observations. We had like a treasure trove of data. It was absolutely thrilling. And ever since that day, and for many months to come, New Horizons is going to be playing back images from the flyby like this one, which was just released last night. My coworkers and I spent most of last weekend <laughs> downloading this. So we put, it, we put a lot of work into this, this getting this image, so I'm glad we could share it with you. But um, after Pluto, what's next is that hopefully, if New Horizons is given an extended mission by NASA, if that's approved, then we get to fly by another Kuiper Belt object on New Year's Day 2019. So that's what's ahead for us. I have here a book. It's a handbook for amateur astronomers, and it belonged to my grandfather when he was a boy. It has his name written in it and everything. The copyright date says 1929. But if you leaf through to the section on planets, you see that this edition has a late-breaking update. A new planet had just been discovered, Pluto. A lot of the information on Pluto in here is pretty sketchy. You see a lot of words like probable and apparently used. But you feel the excitement of this new discovery. Having worked for years to send a robotic explorer to Pluto for the first time, I share that sense of excitement. New Horizons is going to rewrite the book on Pluto and the outer solar system. But in another sense, it's just another beginning, a prelude, hopefully, to an era of outer solar system exploration that will give us new insight into the formation of our home in space. Thank you. <laughs>